I don't have an official Wikipedia page, but there's a bunch of these like internet celebrity pages. And um, this is one that my niece texted me and it's really weird. I haven't like gone through it yet, but it says celebrities, Mike Figueredo, wiki biography, age, husband, ethnicity, uh, dating. Is he gay? (laughs) (laughs) Who is Mike Figueredo? Born under the sign of cancer. Uh, Mike is a 31, so they haven't updated it. 31-year-old Caucasian American podcast host, political scientist. I'm not a political scientist. Um, I was doing political science work, but I wasn't a political scientist, unfortunately. But I do appreciate them really bumping up my uh, my uh, profile. Uh, activist and commentator. His progressive and somewhat extreme... View- How are my views extreme? My views are not extreme. I mean, in the context of American politics, sure, maybe. But somewhat extreme views... Come on. Best known for his now globally famous podcast. They make me sound so huge. Like, this is like, uh, they're trying to inflate my ego, I feel like. This makes me feel more important than I really am. Uh, The Humanist Report. Mike has managed to stir up controversy. No, I haven't. Unless they've been following the uh, Twitter sphere lately. Although I haven't really done much to participate in that and gained the attention of many politicians and public figures. He began his podcasting career in 2015 and has expanded his influence on the political scene in the United States. I don't actually agree with that. I don't think I've expanded my influence. Um, Yeah. If you're extreme, the rest of political YouTube is hardcore, right? I feel like I'm not extreme. Yeah. He'll be saying it's official. Mike is a political scientist. (laughs) I mean, that was the intended goal. And part of me, like, wonders in an alternate reality if I never uh, left the PhD program and started a podcast, what it would be like. Like, would I still enjoy doing political science stuff? I wonder. Mike Mike has a husband, but is he gay? Right. I love how they use the uh, Christmas photo. Uh, Just a simple reminder that this article is created and owned by biographytribune.com article cannot be republished in any other pages or documents copyright is protected by dm jesus christ dude holy fuck are they gonna like copyright claim me for for reading an article about myself that actually worries me a little bit what the fuck oh so this is okay i was wondering where they got this picture from this is from the facebook page for the humanist report um okay early life and education a lifelong infatuation with politics and sociology. Uh, I wouldn't agree with that. Um, I don't have a lifelong infatuation with politics. I got into it when I was like around 18, casually. And I'm interested in sociology, but I'm not like infatuated at all with sociology. So I'm wondering where they got this from. Um, hang on one sec. Although he hasn't specified anything about his place of birth, uh, we know that Mike was born in the United States. Very true. And has a younger sister who is married. Okay, so it does say the sister who is married. But this is the first time that I've seen younger sister. I actually have multiple siblings. I have two sisters, two brothers. They're both older than me, though. So this is interesting. But otherwise, he has always strived to keep his private life hidden from the public eye. I mean, I haven't, like, strived to keep it hidden. But I guess that they can make that assumption, perhaps. Um, which makes sense given the notoriety he has gained from some of his views and statements. They make me seem like I'm some fucking, like, um, insurrectionist or something. Like, I, I, I think that, look, comparatively speaking, my views are pretty milk toast, right? Like, I don't think that I'm as extreme as they're making me out to be. His parents' identities are unknown, but Mike himself stated that they are the biggest reason he has an activist's mindset. I don't, have I said that? Maybe I did, but now I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, extremist recluse, Mike Figueredo. That, that is, yeah, that is accurate. <laughs> this thread is just your borderline terrorist, right? It, is, it, it feels really weird to read this, but I think that because it's like the 300th episode, this is kind of a cool thing, like to celebrate the show and where it's gone and hear it from like someone else who's not really in our like sphere of things, not in our political social circles. Uh, while we don't know which college Mike went to, it's been confirmed that he obtained a bachelor's and a master's degree in political science. That is true. As of mid-2019, he is on his way to earning a PhD in public policy. His inherent will to be impactful and excellent 
theoretical knowledge in politics and sociology were the perfect foundations for his career. That's kind of sweet, right? Um, I'm no longer on my way to getting a PhD. I'm pretty sure they would welcome me back. But that ain't happening. Areas of expertise. According to his bio on the Human Support website... Okay, so this is where they got some of the information. Let me see. Is this... Uh... Okay, yeah, so this is still up. I don't even know what the fuck is there. It could be all outdated. But uh, Mike focuses mainly on international affairs and comparative politics, specializing in U.S. foreign policy as well as social movements and activism in the Middle East and North Africa. So this is true, but in academia. So my master's was a focus of international relations and comparative politics, and I wrote my master's thesis on the Middle East and North Africa and social movements, in particular LGBTQ plus movements, but I don't talk about this stuff on the show. And that's because unless you follow it very, very closely uh, and you keep up with it, it's really easy to lose touch with what's happening. So I don't really like, I don't really talk about that. I keep it domestic. I try to stay in my own lane. Um, yeah, Mike sure is a radical Antifa communist gay NASA agent. True. That's true. I can't. Confirm or deny, actually. I'm going to I'm gonna walk that back a little bit. Uh, a favorite subject of his are U.S. elections. Oh, God, no, they're not. He devotes a significant amount of airtime on his podcast. That doesn't mean it's my favorite. Uh, I mean, maybe at first, like maybe 2015, 2019, where I have hope. But I, I fucking am so, like, I have election fatigue to the highest extent. In addition to his knowledge of current events, Figueroa has extensive expertise in political philosophy. No, I do not have ex expertise in political philosophy. I have an interest in political philosophy. I do not have extensive expertise. I appreciate them saying that, but I absolutely do not. A campaign finance laws and other forms of politically related legislature. Um, politically related legislature. Literature, maybe, is what they meant to say. Um, campaign finance laws, not necessarily. I was going to write my... Uh, dissertation on campaign finance but i did not so maybe that's where they like plucked that from i wonder yeah just cl just claim all of this starting the human support and gaming gaining fame i feel like that's like okay if, if i'm if i'm like celebrity as they say it's like z-list celebrity which is good because anything more than that would um make me want to hide under a rock because i do not want notoriety contrary to popular belief i mean i'm streaming on twitch right now so you know I'm, it's i'm talking to an audience but like being like a celebrity sounds horrible like a real one not like an internet loudmouth fucker like me uh on june 15th of 2015 mike decided to put his knowledge and experience to use by launching the first episode of the huna support which we just watched from the beginning it became clear that he had no intention of being neutral See, because I'm an extremist. Uh, according to Mike himself, our primary goal is not to appear neutral, but to remain objective. True. But we do not aim to strike a false balance between preposterous political positions, but instead strive to maintain ideological consistency across a broad spectrum of political issues. With such an attitude, Mike aroused a lot of viewers, including garnering a lot of negative responses from mainly right-wing and centrist media. I don't necessarily think this is true. I mean, I'm sure that I have garnered negative responses, but I haven't seen that much. Like, you can see people, like, talking shit on YouTube. But right-wing media and centrist media doesn't know I exist. Well, you know what? Actually, to be fair, what they may be talking to is... Uh, I don't know if you remember, but in 2016, um, one of my clips or something... I, I'm blanking on it. I was on uh, Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. He had Bernie on for an interview, and I criticized Bernie because he wasn't standing up for Tim Canova or campaigning for Tim Canova because he was trying to appease Hillary Clinton. Turns out, in hindsight, Bernie was right and I was wrong because Tim Canova is now a MAGA chud. Yeah. But um, they wrote about my video in an NBC News article, I think, and then Chuck Todd then read the quote from that article, I want to say. So actually, that might be what they're referencing, so I'm not going to dismiss it. Perhaps that's what they're referring to. But I mean, it's pretty, pretty isolated. 
Thanks. You know, Senator, one of your supporters, uh, uh, Mike uh, Figueredo, uh, ho hosts a progressive, uh, it's called Humanist Report podcast, and he was really upset at you personally because he actually thought you abandoned Mr. Canova. He thought, where were you? You didn't campaign for him. Uh, and he even said, look, that feeling you felt when Elizabeth Warren abandoned you and chose to run away from you during the Massachusetts primary, that's what Tim Canova is feeling right now what do you say to him or any other sanders supporters <laughs> well what that i feel as if you didn't do enough our, well you know there are a lot of things happening in this country and things happening in my own state and work that i have got to do i can't do everything i'm not sure though let's see during the 2016 presidential campaign mike voiced his support for bernie sanders the then governor of the state of vermont no bernie sanders was not the governor of the state of vermont that is incorrect bernie is the senator from vermont he was the mayor of burlington vermont on the humanist report mike posted a series of videos in which he elaborated on why sanders was the ideal candidate for the progressive times we live in his youtube channel then attracted many like-minded progress progressive individuals who shared their support of the left-leaning Democratic candidate. It is widely believed that the coverage from the Humanist Report and similar podcasts largely contributed to Sanders game gaining prominence, Jesus, in a short time span. I mean, I would love to take credit for Bernie Sanders' rise, but that's not actually the case. When I started my podcast, he was already kind of like on the rise. But I mean, if they want to give me credit and say I'm a political scientist, I'll take it. The now famous, I, I love that they're using all these words. They're like, really, they're talking me up. And I really appreciate that. But unfortunately, it's not warranted. Um, the now famous podcast host got an offer to collaborate with Cenk Uger, the owner and CEO of the Young Turks Media House and YouTube channel. Uh, on many occasions, he voiced his support of Uger and he, the stances he expresses through his media. I wonder what this means. Twitter. Uh, this is one of my favorite videos of Cenk Uger. From Cenk Uger of all time, the only thing missing was a mic drop at the end. Dave Rubin said is one of the biggest and most dangerous frauds in American politics currently. Despite being gay, he fosters the spread of homophobia. So this must have been like something. So Tucker Carlson does his not. Okay, this was this was a based video. This was a based video. Um, let's see here. Where am I? Where the fuck am I? Oh. Is it right? Oh, after this partnership became official, uh, Mike rose to perhaps be the most important voice in the net neutrality debate. Jesus, I wouldn't say that, right? I would not say that. If you don't start owning all these claims, are going to be bad. They, they're making it seem as if like this merger between TYT and the human support is like comparable to Disney acquiring Marvel. Um, that's not actually the case. So... I joined TYT Network in 2017 when Kyle recommended me to Jenk. He's like, hey, you should you should let Mike join. He is having issues with like copyright and he basically agrees with everything and he'd fit right in. So, um, yeah, I'm still a part of TYT Network and it doesn't necessarily entail collaboration like they're saying. Although I have uh, like I was on the Young Turks earlier this year and like what was it like June, I want to say. And that was the first time actually I was ever on the panel. But for the most part, um, they are my MCN. That's what TYT Network provided. I don't know that TYT Network exists anymore as it was, but they still do function as my MCN, which is multi-channel network. And what that means is, and, and these don't really exist that much anymore. What a multi-channel network partner does is they kind of act as an attorney for you to YouTube. So you don't get a YouTube representative contact until you hit, I believe, a million subscribers on YouTube. So since I'm too small to have a YouTube representative, I <laughs> MC Ed with TYT shakes my head sell out. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So um, you you have to align with a bigger channel and join an MCN if you want protection from like copyright strikes and whatnot. So before like before I had an MCN and before I had uh, TYT as my MCN, I didn't like I didn't have any like thing to do. Like I could tweet at YouTube uh, on Twitter, but if I got a copyright strike, there's nothing I could do. But now because I'm part of TYT network, I can like contact Aaron who's part of TYT um and he can elevate this and take this to the YouTube representative so it's like 
MCNs are not really that popular anymore, hence why I think TYT Network in general, like I genuinely don't know if it exists. But once you hit 1 million, the need for a, an MCN basically goes away. Um, and I know that there was like a falling out between like Kyle and, and the Young Turks and everything recently, and I won't get into that. But since he's almost at like 1 million, he is going to get a YouTube rep. So that it that does like really help because then you actually... If if everything goes wrong, if your account gets like hacked or you get doxxed or something, like you do have someone from YouTube who will help you, which is really really important. It's really nice to have, uh, because you know you're your own boss in this in this field, you know. So you you need to have someone to be able to like complain to. So um, it's nice to have that. But um, yeah, I don't know if there's I don't think they're taking in network partners or anything like that. But yeah. I also what's really nice is that like if YouTube makes a policy change, they have the tendency to never, ever, ever tell anyone about it. It just happens. But if if you have an MCN, then they uh, they they tell their MCNs and MCNs then tell their partners. So I know usually ahead of time if YouTube is going to have like some sort of change that's going to fuck us over. Um, or if there's going to be some demonetization or a subscriber purge. So it's really nice to have that. I think that part of the reason why MCNs are not very popular anymore is because YouTube has basically, they have been more active on Twitter. So if there is an issue, you can tweet at them before it wouldn't really do much. Uh, but now they are pretty responsive at helping creators. And also MCNs take a pretty big cut. Um, they take a lot of money from you. Uh, TYT doesn't. They take like five to ten percent, fifteen percent max of your uh, of my ad revenue. But normally, like MCNs, when I first started, like when I gained like ten thousand subs, um, MCNs were like trying to get me to join, and they wanted like twenty five to thirty percent of my monthly income on YouTube. And YouTube already takes like a portion of ad revenue. As the government planned to legalize the separation of different information online, Figueredo took a stand and posted a series of videos on the subject. Every segment and podcast episode of this went viral in a matter of days. True, true. I got a lot of views from that. I was really encouraged to see like the hard work that I put in finally pay off. It was really cool. Although none of the videos that I posted about net, net neutrality hit the trending page of YouTube because I was checking. I mean, I was getting trending numbers, but it, they never did. They never did. Um, every, yeah, okay, so we read that. Uh, Mike's efforts were so influential that Ajit Pai, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, played the video of his in which he openly criticizes Pai and several Republican commissioners. That was actually really cool. That was based when they did the telecom prom and they played my video. That was awesome. What are Mike's political view? This is what I want to know because it's like they say or suggest that I'm an extremist. But what is it? Oh, I also want to get to this too. Personal life. Is he gay? Who is his husband? Question answer <laughs> um mike considers himself politically independent but has expressed his liking for socialism on several occasions true uh he is also anti-establishment and supports several facets of libertarianism not true i do not support libertarianism uh maybe like social libertarianism or like i don't know but uh no Policies Mike advocates are net neutrality, the abolition of public college tuition, federal legalization of marijuana and decriminalization of all drugs, as well as the closure of all military bases on foreign soil with the controversial nature of his views. Okay, those aren't those are milk toast. Like you named the most milk toast positions that I have. Like they could have cited he wants to nationalize every single hospital in the United States. He wants to nationalize the fossil fuel industry. Like you could have really cited some more things if you wanted to like prove that I'm extreme, not that they were trying to like make an argument, but these are not extreme. These are very milk toast policies, I think. Maybe like US bases being closed, they think that that's more extreme, but I mean, it's not very that's not extreme comparatively speaking. With the controversial nature of his views, Mike was the recipient of both praise and criticism during the 2016 presidential election. On 20 April 2019, he had his first interview with a presidential candidate uh, when Andrew Yang appeared on The Humanist Report. Actually, the first presidential candidate I had on was Jill Stein back in 2016, I want to say. 
Recently, he also stated that he's in the process of writing two books. Yeah, that's not... I have not done anything. I did say that, though, at the time, but I just, like, stopped writing them and gave up. Um, this was just my uh, master's thesis, which I was going to publish, but never did because I was lazy. And then this was a book that I started. This was going to basically lead uh, to my PhD dissertation that I was planning and doing research for that I never started. Um, but yeah, not, I don't know. Like I'm too lazy to write a book right now. I have no interest in it. Maybe in the future I will, but like, I don't know what else to say other than I, you know, have already said on the show. Um, okay. Since the beginning of his podcasting career, Mike has always been open about his sexuality, immediately stating that he is an activist for gay rights. He never revealed, uh, the identity of his partner, but it is known that they have been together for a long time. True. True. They have been together for a long time and in 2017 married in a private ceremony. You know that because I tweeted about it, I think, right? Uh, Mike is also fond of animals and regularly features his cat, an adopted kitten, uh, and his dog, a pug, on his Instagram. Yeah, well, yes, this is the star of our Twitch streams, ladies and gentlemen, and NBs. Um, Mike has big extended family with 16 nephews and nieces. That is true. So it's interesting to me. Um, by the way, now I have like 18 or 19. I've lost track. Um, but they were correct about this. I think probably because I said it on Twitter at some point. Uh, but the younger sister who's married was incorrect. So it's interesting. He has at least one tattoo. Technically true. Technically true, which is on display when he's wearing a short sleeve t shirt during the episodes of the Humanist Report. I wonder, like, this person probably doesn't know anything. So, like, okay, I gotta research another dickhead on YouTube because this is my job. So, he has one tattoo. I don't know. He wears glasses. Like, they're trying to find out, like, what else is, um, is possibly noteworthy. What is Mike Figueredo's net worth? I'm curious. According to the latest data from credible sources, Mike's net worth is estimated at well over 1 million as of 2019. God damn. Oh, oh, Lord Jesus. If that were true, folks, that would be wonderful, but that is not true. <laughs> and what I will say is that the reason why I think that a lot of these articles are automatically generated is because if they don't necessarily know something um, about net worth, they'll automatically just fill it in with one to five million. Anyone who has like a semi-large platform, it's one to five million. And so I saw back in uh, in 2019 when Brianna Joy Gray was working for Bernie's campaign, one of the like libs on Twitter was trying to hypocrisy burn her and shared like an article saying, this is your net worth, one to five million. And like, I, I, I like responded. I'm like, they all say one to 5 million. Like if you have a YouTube channel with like at least a hundred thousand subscribers, that's like the default. This unfortunately is in correct. Not even close, not even close, uh, accumulated largely through a large number of sponsorships. Incorrect. Uh, don't do any sponsorships, published articles, never paid for anything that was published and guest appearances, never paid for a guest appearance. Uh, he regularly appears on the rational national, uh, the progressive voice and other prominent podcasts on YouTube shows. Um, I have to disclose, I have never been paid for an appearance on the rational national or progressive voice, but if they did pay, I'm sure that it would be upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars in speaking fees. Yeah. Yeah. If I, man, if I had like over a million, that would be so nice because I would just pay off my student loan debt. That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. But I think that probably any, anyone, like if you searched up like David Dole, one to five million. Um, in fact, let me, let me, let me see real quick. It, it'll just say the same thing for everyone. David Dole, five million. Like, David Dole is not worth five million. It's it's always like one to five million or one or five million. Let me see Kyle. So Kyle is uh, estimated net worth of uh, one million. How is David Dole five million? But Kyle is one million, and I'm estimated well over one million. It's really interesting, right? Because Kyle, in theory, should be the most uh, have the highest net worth if he's the largest and gets a lot more views than. Uh, me and, and David Dole. Yeah, damn, my beautiful little commentators are hiding out. Yeah, so it's funny, like, when I, um, 
when I when I saw Brianna Joy Gray get that like um get that smear attempt, I was like, no, like I don't know if she realized it, but it's like it's all the same thing. Yeah, David is so much richer than Kyle. It's weird to see this because I wonder what they like what did they base this on? And I don't think they based it on anything. I think they just say, well, okay, one hundred thousand subscribers, this many views, it must be like this much. Because like the things that they say, it's like um a large number of sponsorships, which I don't do any sponsors, you all know that. Published articles don't i did like three for huffington post on their contributor platform that i didn't get paid for and then guest appearances we all go on each other's shows and none of us pay each other we just like re-upload and monetize so it is really interesting although i will say they might have got the perception that i have a large number of sponsorships because back in like circa 2016 2017 of the humanist report when the full episode would launch it the announcer guy would say sponsor this is the humanist report sponsored by amazon uh audible and the reason why i said that um is because that was part of the amazon affiliate program and most youtubers have the little i mean i don't have it anymore i got kicked from the program years ago but you can like have an amazon link and then you could tell people to shop there and then you get a little bit of a cut but the reason why i said sponsored by amazon and audible is because i thought that you had to say sponsored uh, but actually, me saying that I was sponsored by Amazon was a violation of their TOS, in my opinion. But I thought I was like I was like following it and trying to be clear. But I only made I think I made like in total a hundred dollars from Amazon sponsorship. So it's interesting. And even saying that is like a violation of TOS. Not that I would ever get back in the Amazon affiliate program. But yeah, that that could be what they're basing it off of. Is what I'm thinking. Um, online presence, a, a distinguished online celebrity. Wow. I, uh, I don't, I don't know about that one, bud. I don't know about that one. Mike heavily relies on his YouTube channel to reach his audience. True. In an immediate, uh, in an easy and immediate way. As of mid 2019, the human support has 230,000 active subs with a total of 60 million unique views. I have no idea how much unique views we have now. As a means of financing his research and podcast episodes, Mike runs a Patreon account. I don't need to finance research. My my re my research is um Google. Mike bangs Bezos because he's on Twitch. <laughs> I know in a roundabout way, right? Now I'm getting the uh, the Bezos bucks. See, they they kicked me out of the affiliate program, but they're still giving me money through Twitch. Oh, and there's one comment from will gutierrez i enjoy your podcast very much this is really sweet oh they th i think they th thought maybe this was written by me i enjoy your podcast very much i am 86 years old wow nowhere near being a techie uh and am forever foiled by occasional gl glitches on my google pixel 4 this person sounds so cute and they're so so wholesome which i will have to call verizon to be bailed out of philosophically uh, we are not I identical, but that is acceptable. We are two distinct individuals. I do share viewing your podcasts with my wife of 66 years. Whoa. Holy shit. Uh, most often at dinner table, your insight on mostly all things are right on. Thank you. That's This is a really sweet person. This is a really sweet person. This just like made my day. What a really kind person. That's so wholesome, right? Like, what? so wholesome most of the time i'll see comments saying like you fucking shit lib neo lib motherfucking tyt katzenberg money sucking asshole motherfucker like but to see this is really wholesome yeah based boomer right very sweet very sweet well folks i think that that is uh we've done everything we could possibly do accomplish here we found out that David Dole is very rich. He's a multimillionaire. Kyle only has one million, like the peasant that he is. Even I have more than that. Um, this is funny. Oh, see, this one is different. They have like age and height and stuff like that. Kyle Kalinske is six foot tall. Oh, this one has quotes. See, this would be interesting to read. I say I'm done. I'm out. I'm not playing that shitty game. I have no time for philosophical airy bullshit. <laughs> I love how these are the quotes that they provide. Love it. 